I want to welcome you to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. It's always such a blessing to be with you and to get into the scriptures. We're in the book of Psalms, which is a, a passage I go to quite often. We're looking at five psalms at a time between different series. And I can tell you that I don't know if I'm ever going to stop doing that because this is a portion of the Word of God that just speaks to my heart. It is the cry of my heart, and I hope you can relate. We looked at Psalm 37 last week. Really, we just looked at the first 11 verses. This is a longer psalm, and there were some themes, particular themes, a childlike peace that I wanted to bring out in the first part. Now we're going to look at the full psalm. This psalm is what they call an acrostic psalm. That is that every one of the two-verse stanzas begin with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, that is a very creative way to put this together. Uh, it shows really uh, just a genius in writing, but it's also very practical, very effective for memorization. It would help them as they're thinking on these themes, singing this song, just to, to bring these truths to mind. Because it has this style, uh, I will say it doesn't follow as clear of an outline. In fact, there's not really a, an absolute clear outline in Psalm 37. That's often the case with the Psalms. It's, it's more like the Proverbs, dispensing different aspects of wisdom with every verse, or we could say with every letter, if you will. That being the case, I'm not going to go through this verse by verse. That's usually the way that I like to break a psalm or a passage of scripture down, build my outline from the text. Uh, we're going to focus on the overall theme and see how the different uh, passages in this psalm build on that theme. The title that I've given this is The Steps of a Good Man. And that comes from verses 23 and 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You're going somewhere in this life. Now, it might be your path looks a lot like this. That's kind of all of our paths. Our situations pull us this way and that. Our circumstances draw us back and forth. But ultimately, you're going to end up somewhere. Our path through this life brings us somewhere in eternity. And of course, the scriptures teach us there's only two real destinations in the end. There is the broad way that leads to destruction, and there is that straight or narrow way that leads to life everlasting. And so this is a psalm that bids us to consider our steps, to consider the path we're on. Even as believers, there is conviction that can come out of a psalm like this. Uh, we can easily become like Christian in that story, Pilgrim's Progress. I went through this a study on Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan's book, a couple years ago with the church. And Christian, the main character in the story, he's on his path to the celestial city. And it's a very clear path. It's a very clear way. But along that way, there are shortcuts. We should put quotation marks there on that. What seems like a shortcut, what seems like an easier path. But every time Christian takes one of these paths, it leads to problems. And of course, one of the worst places is, is to the dungeon of the giant despair. Have you been there? Thinking that we have an easier way and it leads us to all kinds of problems in our life. This is a psalm that bids us to consider our steps, but also to find the hope and the courage of the psalmist as we follow the Lord. We're not alone on this journey. There is such encouragement for the believer in Psalm 37. So let's break it down. We're going to just focus on these two verses, but we're going to be pulling a lot of other passages from the psalms that build, or from this particular psalm that build on this. First of all, the steps of a good man, they're ordered by the Lord. Ordered meaning they are directed or they are arranged by the Lord. It's God's path, not mine. That goes against the desire of the natural man. You know that song by Frank Sinatra, I Did It My Way? That's a popular song. A lot of people want to claim 
that song, they would like to be able to look back at their life and say, I did it my way. These are my achievements. This is my strength. These are my rewards. And of course, you know, the, the real focus there is that I get to do what I want to do. No one tells me what to do. I selfishly pursue my own desires. You, you can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and Satan's first temptation, be your own God. This has always been his influence. This has been his main attack. Do it your way. Make those your steps. But I tell you, that's a deadly lie. We read in verse 20 of this psalm, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. Verse 35, I've seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green bay tree, exalting in his strength and his achievements. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Verse 38, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. That's where that path is headed, no matter how successful you think your steps are along the way. That broad road is an easy path until you get to the chasm of destruction. By contrast, the true believer finds fulfillment, he finds peace, because he's following God's way. And we see that it come out beautifully in this psalm. Verse 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. That is God's good. The evil that he reveals that is against his good will. Depart from it, follow his path, and you'll find his blessing. That's the promise. This is not slavery to have my steps ordered by the Lord. This is not just a, a task I'm trying to fulfill so I can get my selfish desires this is what real life is all about. This is what gives me confidence to go forward, even when the way is dark. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to endure, but if God is ordering this path, if He's directing my steps, then I can face anything. I know it's the right path. I know it's where I need to be, and that's the confidence that I need. That's what gives me peace. I can be sure there's His blessing on the other side. Now, I do want to bring out, as I talk about this, verse 31, that says of the believer that the law of his God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. To have your steps ordered by the Lord doesn't just mean you're following a religion or you're trying to keep the rules. It's talking about a relationship with the Lord. It means that you've come to see the emptiness of your own way and your own foolish desires, and you've sought salvation from sin. Not just from hell, but from sin, from the power of this flesh through that work of Christ for you on the cross. So now, as a child of God, knowing that Christ has redeemed you, you rejoice to be able to follow the Lord. You still have your struggles, but God's word's in your heart. I want the Lord to order me in His way. That's my desire. That's my focus in life. This is the, the heart of the believer. Is it your heart? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. The he there, speaking of God. God delights in our way. Now, I don't know about you, but I think often of God as best just being satisfied with me. Uh, Far more often, I think of him being frustrated or angry at all of my failures. The whole concept of God delighting in me, this failing, struggling sinner, that's shocking to me. But that's the gospel. That's the message of God's word again and again. Micah 7, 18, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the remnant of the, uh, the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Jesus says there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents in Luke 15, verse 7. This delight, get this, it isn't about me 
proving my worthiness. It isn't God looking at me and just being impressed by what a great person I am. It's God delighting to show his grace and love to me in saving me from that sin, but then in keeping me in his way, glorifying me, his name, in the, in the greatest way as he takes me with all of my struggles and failures and he uses me to exalt his name. God delights in his grace. You know, another way of looking at this, though, is that God delights to fellowship with me. The path that he takes me on is one of communion with him, where I'm drawn closer and closer to him every single day. Kind of makes me think about Jesus on that road to Emmaus with those two men. Now, their hearts burned within them as they talked with Jesus by the way, But do you not think that Jesus enjoyed that just as much? He rejoiced to open up the scriptures, not just to their eyes, but to their heart. Revelation 3.20 gives us this promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. God wants to fellowship with you. God wants that communion with his people. Never think, Christian, that he is too busy, that he's afar off, that he doesn't care, that he's upset. No, when our hearts get cold, when we lose that joy, we're on the wrong path. The issue is not with God, it's with our steps. Let your steps be ordered by the Lord and you're going to find his delight. But then, verse 24, though he fall. You know, it's not a question of if. It's going to happen. It's when. Just consider the warfare that we are in. The psalm, just like many other psalms, has battle scenes that are kind of brought into it. Verse 12, The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. You know, David very, could very well be speaking about a physical assault by an enemy because he had that. He was a man who faced battle against the Philistines, battle against Saul, battle against Absalom, battle against the nations around him. He, he dealt with that in a real way. But if we only look at it from that context, we can seem very far removed from what he endured. Well, that's not, that's not something I know anything about. But the greatest application of this psalm and any other psalm where you see this kind of warfare language is a spiritual warfare. That's very real. We're told in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The host of darkness, we're talking about Satan, And these spiritual enemies that follow him, they're very real. And they seek to move us from God's path. They want to move our steps away from him. And they've got all kinds of weapons at their disposal. Not swords and spears necessarily. We're not physically persecuted here in the United States right now for going to church. But boy, we're assaulted with pleasures, with pressures from our peers, whether that's school or work or in, in the entertainment world. And you know what? His greatest weapon that he uses against me, it's in my heart it's, or it's in my flesh. He pulls upon these desires, this pride, this selfishness, this frustration, this anger, this lust. He gets a hold of it and he seeks to pull my steps away from the Lord. I can tell you the bow is always bent. The sword is always drawn. That assault, it never stops all through this life. And you know what? In the midst of that battle, all of us have fallen many times. Last week, Pastor Bill preached about Peter sitting with the servants of the high priest and denying Christ. Right after he promised, to, I'll go with you to death. You can count on me, Lord. There he is. I know not the man. But you know, as I'm listening to that message, I'm not thinking, oh, foolish Peter. I'm thinking, oh, the fool that I am. I think about all the times that I've fallen back into a worldly way of thinking and acting, how my steps veered away from my Lord. You know, there's never an excuse for that. 
We want to say, well, the path was too hard, the enemy was too great, the way was confusing, but if my path is ordered by the Lord, if He's there with me, if I'm enjoying His delight, His presence, can anything make you fall when you're walking close to Him, when you're like this picture hand in hand from a spiritual context? No, my flesh gets pulled away. My focus turns away. My steps veer from Him. And boy, that leads me to a pit. It leads me to a fall. But you know, the wonder of this psalm is that the fallen believer shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. It would make total sense for the Lord to lead us, leave us down there in that pit that we fall in, that spiritual failure. That's, that's my sin that I chose. Even after knowing His grace and His blessing and the work of Christ and the joy of His fellowship, I still went back there to the world. What a fool. You know, you think about when somebody really hurts you and all of us have been there. And they just, man, you trusted them, they let you down. And maybe you trusted them again, they let you down. They, you trust them again, they let you down. Well, how often are you willing to forgive? Seven times is a lot. To restore them. Well, you know, by God's grace, you might find the strength to accept them back, but it's really easy to hold them at arm's length and say, you know what, I just can't trust you anymore. I don't want you hurting me anymore. But here is God. He's a God that completely lifts His people back up out of that pit, and He embraces them. Here's Peter. He reaches down to him and says, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. He lifts David up. Think about what David, how he fought, fell. When he talks about though he fall, he's thinking about adultery with Bathsheba. He's thinking about the murder of Uriah the Hittite. And yet he wasn't utterly cast down. The Lord says, that's a man after my own heart. Yeah, he sinned, but he is brought to a place of conviction and repentance and drawn back to the Lord. He's lifted up out of that pit. Verse 25, David goes on to say, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Verse 32 says, The wicked watcheth the righteous, and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Verse 39, But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Verse 40, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Not because they're worthy, not because they, they've proven themselves or made up for their sin. No, they trust in him. They're there in that pit crying out with a heart of repentance and there he is lifting them right back up. You can relate to this if you're a believer. I know you can I know you can't because you're here rejoicing with me again in the word. Had the Lord left us in that pit, had he, had he not shown his hand of grace, we would have just given up a long time ago. We would have been like that plant that shoots up for a time in Jesus' parable of the seed, and then the sun comes out and it just withers away. But no, we're here because he wouldn't let us go. He's lifting us up. He's convicting us. He's chastening us. But... That's not all, because if that's all that he did, we would despair. Satan would make us think there is no hope, but the Lord gives assurance to your heart of his grace and love through Jesus Christ. That the price of that sin is paid on the cross. That same hope you found on the day you're converted, you find it again and again, perhaps in an even fuller sense as a believer, as the Lord lifts you back up and draws you out of that sin and restores your walk with him. That terrible failure can make you to grow closer to Him in the end. I'm not saying there's, it's a good thing that we fail, but it's a wondrous thing that by His grace, He helps us to grow through it all closer to Him. I want to point out last of all that this psalm, particularly verses 23 and 24, this isn't just a promise we can look back on. This is our hope for the future. If the Lord doesn't come back today, in fact, if the Lord doesn't come back in perhaps a few minutes, I'm going to fall. I, I, I can't say. I know I'm going to struggle. 
And I can't take it lightly. Again, there is a price for sin. It's a terrible thing, but it's not my doom. Verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Verse 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Now for Israel, this was a very physical blessing. You can look into the history there in the scriptures and you see when they're following the Lord, when they're trusting the Lord, submitting to the Lord, their steps are ordered by the Lord, they have victory over their enemies, they have peace in that promised land, they have blessing. For us, this is more real though from a spiritual standpoint. That's how you've got to take this. These steps, this path is taking me to glory. That's where this journey is, is, is going to. And it's a straight and narrow road. It's a hard path. It, it goes down through the valley of humiliation and the valley of the shadow of death, to go back to the Pilgrim's Progress analogy. But it's headed to the celestial city. It's headed to the presence of the Lord. It's headed to a place where I'm never going to fall again as I'm with Him, perfected forever. David says again in verse 25, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You know, you think about all those ups and downs of David's life. You think about the triumphs, but also all those horrible spiritual and physical defeats. From the cave to the palace, though, from his youth to the grave, God was always there. God always provided for him. God always blessed him. God always kept him. Can you say the same? Can you can look back at your life as a believer and say, I've never been forsaken. In fact, I can look around and I've never seen God's people forsaken. I've seen them suffer. I've seen them face trials that made no sense. I've seen them lose much in this world, but I've never seen the Lord fail in His promises. I've never seen the Lord abandon His people. Is this a psalm of rejoicing for you? Don't just answer that with words. I want you to examine your heart. I want you to examine your steps. What peace to know when my steps are ordered by the Lord. That though I can't see Him with my eyes, He's there with me every step of the way. He's delighting in me in that way. And though we face those challenges and this terrible spiritual foe, He's never going to let me go. He's never going to leave me down. He's going to lift me up and uphold me with His hand until he brings me to the blessed end in glory. Can you rejoice in Psalm 37 with me? I pray you can. What a beautiful promise for God's people. Pray that's an encouragement to you. Look forward to going on in the Psalms in the weeks to come. May the Lord bless you.